Hello again, friends. Um, thank you for stopping by. Um, today I'm going to tell you about a, a wonderful trip I had um, last week. I went to New York City and uh, it was awesome. I managed to get a lot of things done, including checking some things off my bucket list. Namely, a visit to the Macintosh, to the Macintosh factory up in Binghamton, New York. I also visited Audio Classics, and they've been around for a long, long time also. I've always wanted to visit them. I also had a chance to um, visit Fernando over by SkyFi Audio in Glen Rock, New Jersey, and that was really, really good. It was a great visit also. And um, along the way, I, um, I did some vinyl digging along the way in New York City. Um, I went to the uh, Princeton uh, Record Exchange, and uh, it was awesome. We got a lot of stuff over there. And I, uh, I did a, uh, another video talking about um, my vinyl uh, experience in, in, uh, in New York City um, while I was there. So uh, you might want to check that video out. Um, just, you know, just giving you an update on the record, record stores I visited. But anyway, um, this, this video... I will I will show you pictures and I'll uh, and I have a few videos of my visit to Macintosh and um, Audio Classics and pictures at uh, SkyFi Audio with Fernando. So um, bear with me and just um, enjoy the show. Uh, it's uh, it might be it's not it's not a very long video, but um, I hope you'll enjoy it. But uh, my visit to Macintosh lab was definitely on my bucket list and I've accomplished that so check that was awesome um, all right so we'll, we'll uh, I'll just show you what what happened thank you I arrived at Macintosh about two hours before the factory before the factory tour started. It started at 9:30, so I had to wait a bit to uh, to get it, to get going. And um, I did I did notice the building uh, itself. It looks like it reminds me of my MC402 power amplifier. All it needs now are two VU meters on the building to be flashing, and then we have a complete amplifier. But you can tell um, the the amplifier or the building was inspired by one or the other. Don't know which, but it looks like Macintosh gear. The building does look like Macintosh gear. So um, we started the tour, and um, the, the tour guide was Chuck engine and um, there were other people on the tour um, these are uh, a Japanese 
couple um, from Japan, and these kids they ask so many good, good questions, man. I mean, <laughs> they were they were so smart, so you know they ask a lot of good questions. So which you will see in the video that comes up later on. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you for watching. That's solder. It's hot metal. Oh. Don't touch anything over here. You get burned. <laughs> yeah. Molten metal. Melting metal. That's weird. The other side, or things that don't fit through here, like tube sockets or things that are heat sensitive and shouldn't go through there like the uh, fluorescent displays. So once they put the, the last of the parts on there, we have a completed sub-assembly. So we have a board with all the stuff on it, and then we're going to test that board. Okay. All right. So this is sub-test for testing those completed boards before they go in a unit. Mm -hmm. This is a semi-automated test procedure, uh, and different tests are going to need different test signals, different voltages to power up sections of the board, and you have to measure different circuits mm -hmm. on, on the board. So you might might be 50 or 100 different tests you want to do, mm -hmm. and it originally you would have to set up the stuff for every single test right, and right. clip into the beginning of it and put a signal through and measure at the output and then right. that's test number one. one right. Then move all the wires and right. change all yeah. the dials and go to test number two. So these are uh, insert test fixtures. So this, also called a bed of nails test fixture because it has spring-loaded pins. That will go to all the spots on the circuit board where you want to test it. Mm -hmm. And relays will switch between the different signal paths. The power supply will power up the boards. Uh, it has inputs for uh, the test signal, outputs for the um, output of the signal after it's gone through the circuit, and computer control for doing all the signal paths. Um, so the, then, then the computer will 
control the test equipment and run the test mm -hmm. and it's uh, got the name of each test and uh, uh, voltages and, and test parameters and uh, the, the go no go parameters it needs to be between this or that voltage and when the test is done little green check mark pops up that says oh that test is good and it does the next one so on a board like this we do maybe a hundred tests uh, and originally, before we designed all this, it would have taken about an hour, mm -hmm. and this will do uh, 100 tests in about 90 so, seconds. So there's a rework station after this. If something fails here, there's a rework. Uh, a rework such an hour does yes. a rework up in here. A uh, minor rework will happen here if you're not too busy. Mm. Um, so. Over here we have the blast printing machine. Oh. Whoa. Cool. So up until uh, July 2016, all the glass was printed with a silk screen mm -hmm. and ink. Mm -hmm. And uh, make a silk screen of the what you want to print and put it on and, and squirt ink on there and a big squeegee and print it onto the glass. Uh, and you know, one of the cool things about the product is that when it's off, the lettering is all gold. Mm -hmm. and when you turn it on, it turns green. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's done by first you screen print a black with all the letters are clear, right? Mm -hmm. So they would print that with ink and then put it through an ultraviolet dryer, bring it back, put it on a different screen, and put gold over the lettering. So mm -hmm. when the light hits it from in front, it's gold. Mm -hmm. Then they dry it, bring it back, put gold green behind that. So mm -hmm. when you light it from behind, it turns green. And they would dry it, bring it back, and, and put another layer of black. Uh, we had it down to about seven screens. Uh, originally, it was about 16. Uh, and so we spent about two and a half years in development with 3M and Corning and a couple other people and designed these printers that print all the layers mm -hmm. on the glass at once. So it'll just go back and forth. So what's this flatbed here? That's where all the glass goes. Mm -hmm. And the printer head moves back and forth like that one is, only we can't see what it's doing. Oh, okay. And it is still ultraviolet dry, so there's actually ultraviolet light. You can almost see a little purple shining out from under it. Mm -hmm. So it'll print and dry it mm -hmm. in each pass. And it'll build up all the layers on the board at once. Mm -hmm. But that takes a lot less time than I just showed. Yeah, yeah. These, these, these connectors, I find them kind of tricky to Binding the binding, binding yeah. That's a that's a new design of ours. That's a lot of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is final assembly, so all the different parts that we make here get bolted up together. Morning. Wow. So, which this, which this is final test. So the four, uh, which one is that? That's not it. Um, looks like the 2K? 300 watt stereo. Mm. 600? 600 watt. 600? So you made my 601, huh? Huh? You made my 601? Oh, I probably tested it. <laughs> yeah, pretty likely. Uh, this is a unit after. Oh, okay. Same mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The, uh, so these units, even though there's no top or bottom or glass on them, these are completed working units. And mm -hmm. They're going to get tested. Uh, and the amplifiers are in this line and integrated are in the middle line and players are in the third line over there. And uh, so those. And CD players come through here too? Yep. Everybody. Yeah. Good day.
Okay, so this is our transformer place. Right, now we have transformers. Yep. Oh, most companies just buy transformers mm -hmm. from someplace, but we make our own. Mm -hmm. In uh, the winding machines here. There, there was a lady working for a long time doing yes, this Yes, Sandy West. 1970 until about three years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. She pretty much every transformer. Uh, so the transformer is a is a, a coil, and then with a magnetic core in it. And these are the EI laminations for magnetic core, and uh, so they're going to wind up the the wire on a bobbin here, and then interleaf those EI laminations in. Uh, one thing that a lot of Transformers do is hum. Like yes, if you plug yes. in a battery charger and it starts humming. So traditionally, you'll pack in as many laminations as you can and hold it up real tight. And typically, the transformer will be vacuum impregnated or dipped in varnish. This is why when you see a transformer, it doesn't look like that. It looks shiny and brown because this is it's dipped in varnish. And the varnish will keep these from rattling against each other for a decade or so. But so, a Macintosh unit is brand new a couple decades so old. We want it to last forever. So without the varnish, it will hum? That's where the humming yes. comes in? The, the, the magnetic against. field of the transformer will make these things rattle against mm -hmm. each other. Especially over time, they'll start to loosen up. Mm -hmm. You know, So that's why an old piece of equipment tends to hum because these, these are Just get vibrating. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So to prevent that, we pop them in tar. Back, full of 453 tar. Yeah, bricks of it over here. Oh, so those are the varnish. Those are the. That's uh, tar. Tar. Mm. And well, this is a transformer can. This one is uh, extruded aluminum. We also use drawn aluminum can. And we'll put some tar in the bottom of the can and put the transformer in and fill it up with tar. The tar stays a little bit soft fluid forever so it'll dampen the vibrations Question. So at the these, end of time. So these transformers are the ones that go in here with a tar? Right. Oh, okay. Well that particular case takes a bigger one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have the water jet where What is this? It's a water jet. It's using high pressure water to cut the glass. Whoa. I'll, I'll move That's that a shield glass for a second. For the front of it. Yeah. So these are our glass to be cut. Yep. So this uses high pressure water to cut glass. But if you just shoot water at glass, it kind of moves it out of the way. Yeah. It looks like that, which mm -hmm. is not too great, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the water is mixed with an abrasive. It's garnet, garnet powder, garnet gemstone. Mm -hmm. And garnet is really sharp. If the edges of each crystal are serrated like a steak knife. So the high pressure water mixed with garnet. That's a cut it. Perfectly oh. cut. It comes out just that smooth. And obviously, we used to make the holes with a drill press. Mm -hmm. And we could only make round holes. Because you can't drill a square hole. So this computer could drill and cut any shape that we need. That's it. They cut out of oh, yeah. half inch glass. That's cool. So that mixture of high pressure water 
and Garnet are going to go through this diamond tip focusing tube because diamonds are the only thing this won't cut. And it'll start at 15,000 pounds per square inch and make a little pilot hole everywhere that you want to cut. Mm -hmm. Then it'll relocate back over the pilot hole ramp to 60,000 pounds per square inch and make the cut like it's doing now. Uh, it's like an etch a sketch. You ever play with an etch a sketch? You know what an etch a sketch is? You turn your two knobs and it makes the line, right? That's how it does it. You make a graph with X, Y coordinates programmed into the machine and it moves your head around and touch any shape you want. So, so Chuck, this is the finished product of the um, of the uh, the transformer in the pot. Right. Yeah. Units are all tested. They're going to get the feet and glass and top panels put on and the meter lighting adjusted. That's done right here. Mm -hmm. And so we tested the parts before they went in the board. Then we tested the completed boards. Then we tested the completed unit. Then we're going to do a final test, a function test. So, mm -hmm. fourth test. Wow. And they'll get hooked up to a CD player and a power supply and run music through it and push all the buttons and uh, do the visual inspection and uh, final function test Where's on all the stuff before it goes in the box. Where's the new hybrid power? Um, the there are none right here. Well, that's a hybrid integrated. Mm -hmm. Whoa. C12000 solid state amp and tube preamp. Whoa. This is, this is integrated? MA12000, yes. That's wow. a 350 watt integrated. And this so is a tube preamplifier and solid state amp. Whoa. So, this is the final assembly and shipping and ready to go. Wow. So wait, wait a while. Let me ask you something, Chuck. So everything is made in this factory. Yep. You, you guys make everything. Right. Yes. Most of it from raw materials. Oh. So we got sheet steel, uh, which in the metal shop back there, they take the sheets and bend it and stamp it and cut it and make the pieces. Uh, it's gonna come over here to the paint line and get uh, powder coated or painted depending on uh, the application. Uh, so it'll hang the parts on the little patented magnetized coat hangers and uh, it'll go past papers to paint it and then through the oven and come back out and uh, so there's an oven in there built in there's an oven in there yes that's the oven okay so it's baking the finish onto the to the metal part mm -hmm. so everything except the components themselves you got right here. exactly yeah, everything but like the resistors. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the IC. Those. Yeah. But everything else, raw, raw, raw. material. Yep. Yeah. So we'll take uh, five sheets of steel from U.S. Steel Corp. 
Uh, and uh, the shiny stuff is uh, mirror polish stainless, like those with the blue frist on them. So buy sheets of mirror polish stainless and mm -hmm. cut and stamp and print those. Uh, the, so that all comes from U.S. Steel. The glass comes from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. The magnet wire and laminations from the Transformers comes from U.S. Magnetics. Uh, the raw circuit boards are made by a place called U.S. Board Company. Mm -hmm. U.S. made at, from our designs. And uh, the cardboard comes from the Binghamton Box Company down the street. Packet and U.S. made cardboard. Mm -hmm. So we're making vertically integrated, making yeah. everything from the raw materials everything to the finished product. And there's two reasons to do that. Uh, one is that if we have someone else make the box and someone else make the transformer, yeah. someone else populate the circuit board, yes. they're going to make profit on it, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Every single one of those that we sub out, that's money you're paying not for stuff, but for someone else's profit, right? So oh, as we don't make profit on the box and profit on the circuit board and profit on the transformer. We just make it once. So a large percentage of your money you pay is going into the parts mm -hmm. instead of going to profit to subcontractors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we can send a box somewhere, you know, send a box design overseas and they'll make it for $20 and ship it for $20 and make $20 profit. We'll pay $20 import duty. Mm -hmm. And now you got to pay $100 for a $20 box. Yeah. We, Build a box here for a hundred dollars. You got a hundred dollars for the box. Yeah. We're building it all right here. The other reason is that we want control over the process. So yeah. if, if a box comes in and it's bent wrong and you can't use it, you throw it out. You can't send it twelve thousand miles back to India or wherever. So we, uh, if a box comes out of the metal shop that isn't bent right, we go in there and yell at Jeff. So let me ask you this. Control over the process. Let me ask you this. Quality control. You have a dedicated group that does quality control, and at what we point do. do they do yes. it? We do. Yes. And every person is responsible for inspecting what came from before them. Good answer. So everybody here is quality control. Plus, yes, there's a full quality control department. Okay. And and of course, the the, the QA person is totally independent of. Oh, yeah. All right, so that's how it's made. Let's, let's go see what the toys look like when they're all hooked up and making sound. Okay. Uh, so, Chuck, where, where, where are the speakers and the cables? Oh, the speakers are made down there. They're not really doing anything today. Um, and uh, cables are made at uh, tributaries in Florida. Hmm. Where our cables are made by, uh, by tributaries. We don't make those here. Okay. Are you on fire yet? Not yet. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm considering upgrade, but we'll see. <laughs> So um, I got a question, truck, on on your uh, your um, your cables, yeah. your and speaker and interconnect and stuff, mm -hmm. right? I know that you guys, when when I receive my product, they come with a power cord, right? Right, and then you guys make speakers. Question is, um, for the cables that you make, are you your subsidiary make? Are they the, are they are they the same wires that that are hooked up in the in the, the speakers? Do you use a speaker with, with those the same wire? Uh, the reason I'm asking not. the reason I'm asking is we have a whole cottage industry of um, of cables, and I'm I'm thinking that if if uh, if you guys Good make morning. make the components make the, make the com oh. I met him in the Hawaii before. Yeah. Yeah, so if you guys make the components, right, I figure you would have the same synergy between the wires that 
the interconnects and the and the speaker to have the same the same type of wire that you know you have maximum the maximum performance. Miniature copper. Copper you know, is copper. Yeah. Copper is and, copper. Uh, th there are companies who will use like designer brand capacitors right. and maybe they'll put you know kimber cable wire mm -hmm. inside their loudspeakers mm -hmm. so instead of paying five dollars for the wire inside the speaker they're mm -hmm. paying fifty dollars yes. or a hundred dollars and charging you a hundred dollars for something that doesn't make any difference yes so we don't do things to give marketing departments bullets we only make do things that are going to improve the performance of the product. Because so using a different fancy wire inside the speaker doesn't make it sound any better and we're not wasting money. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's my take on it because it reached a point where I, I've, I've gone through all the expense, a lot of expensive cables with, on my Macintosh system and I change it and I check and I can't tell no difference. So guess what? I start making my own. Right? Yeah. Good idea. Okay, uh, Trump, before you start, I, I want to ask you something. What's the, I can't figure out the rationale for having two amplifiers for one channel. Whoa. This is one channel and that's one channel. Right. But this is a this is this is a mono block here, right? Right. But this is isn't this an amplifier too? Well, these three boxes together are actually a single channel. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a reason so, for that. So, yeah, that's what, that's where uh, multiple amplifiers by amping. Yeah, the the real advantage of by amping is if your amplifier is too small to really drive the speaker without stressing. If you put a separate amp on the mids and highs, then from on the woofers. The effort of driving the woofer might make the one amp distort, but you can't really hear distortion in bass. And the other amp driving the mids and highs isn't working very hard, and it stays clean. Mm -hmm. That's the advantage of bi-amping. It doesn't add power. Mm -hmm. And it's really only an advantage if your amps are too small for your speaker. So really, one big amp is better. So how does these two... So this is our flagship amplifier. Mm -hmm. That's three boxes make a single channel. Um, and... One of the reasons that there are three boxes is that it draws more than 20 amperes from the wall, and you're not allowed greater than a 20 ampere circuit in a residential installation, and UL won't let you put more than one power cord on a box. So if you have three boxes, you can use three electrical circuits. So this only needs two. How are these connected then? They are connected with a big 25-pin uh, aircraft connector that does the equivalent of the eternal connections inside the amplifier. The other reason that this is three boxes is because as the flagship piece, it's the physical manifestation of the quad balance design. That's like in your 601. So a, a balanced amplifier really has two channels, push-pull, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And a quad balanced amplifier has two amplifiers per channel. Mm -hmm. Each one is balanced, so mm -hmm. that's four total channels to make one channel. And so... If you're familiar with the concept that uh, two signals that are out of phase mm -hmm. and equal frequency and equal amplitude, if they're 180 out of phase, they will cancel each other right. and get exactly. nothing, right? Exactly, yeah. So mm -hmm. we take a signal and we put it through a 1,000-watt fully balanced amplifier. Right. Then we make a copy of that signal and mm -hmm. flip it over out mm -hmm. of phase mm -hmm. and put it through another 1,000-watt fully balanced amplifier. Okay. Then we bring them up to the output auto farmer, the patented Macintosh auto farmer, which is why nobody else can do this cool trick. Mm -hmm. And we take the one that's out of phase and flip it back in phase. Now you have two 1,000-watt music signals that combine magnetically for 2,000 watts of output. But because this was... 180 out of phase and we flip it back over mm -hmm. the, the music is now in phase and combines but any noise or distortion that's exactly the same in these two boxes mm -hmm. is 180 degrees out of phase and the amplifier cancels its own self noise mm -hmm. so you have 2000 watts average 8000 watts peak it generates 200 amperes of output current in case you want to arc well the bridge with your stereo and uh, if you put the 
world's best distortion analyzer on there and do a 1K mid-range test tone. The distortion analyzer will read 0.0002%, and if you unhook the amp, it still reads that because that's the residual distortion of the analyzer. So connecting into the speaker, only, only the, the, the top one will connect to the speaker? Yes. Okay, okay. So it's not a matter of saying your um, your your. Uh, it's not like buying. Right, right, right. right. No, nope. these mm. come in for one single one signal, channel. and then you, you connect that to the speaker. Right. Okay, right. I got you. Because I want to, you know, scratch me. Okay. Yep. All right. Good. So, good explanation. This is a 2001 amplifier with the line array 2.1k loudspeaker here, uh, and so there's 2,000 watts on this channel, 2,000 watts on that channel, 2,000 watts on that channel. We have a set of side surround speakers no, under these columns. What? They're on a 400 watt stereo amplifier. Then we have a duplicate of that channel, another side surround speakers on another 400 watt stereo amplifier. We have the back surround speakers, Macintosh in walls, on another 400 watt stereo amplifier. And this is a 14 channel Atmos system, so we have two ceiling Atmos speakers. Those are on a 300 watt stereo amplifier and rear ceiling ammo speakers on another 300 watt stereo amplifier. And of course we wanted subwoofers. So underneath the riser here is six boxes, each with two 12 inch woofers. Jesus. And each double 12 box is on a 1,200 watt amplifier. So the subs are 12 12s on 7,200 watts. Uh, total average power of the system is 16,800 watts. There's over 300 drivers. The, uh, if we blink the lights on all the amps at once, the, the physical force pulling on the cones will be 90 horsepower. So it's like hooking up a Harley to your yes, loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. uh, the maximum output of this system is 133 decibels. So if a 747 was taken off in the parking lot, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hear, hear it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I will not play it that loud. Even though the boss does all the time. Jesus. So let's start with some music. I hear you can't get these anymore. I mean, you, they're... You, well, you can get them if you ordered a year yeah, ago. Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, off the, <laughs> off the, off the shelf, I mean. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they're... Hard to get, hard. To, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's a music server. Got lots of music in there. And we're going to start with some just left and right two-channel music. I have a comment about this. These, yes. These remote. I think truck they should redesign it and, and not put battery in there yes it's, it's impossible to get out it's, yes and you know what it leaks and 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 uh, the battery leaks and mess up my circuit board in there this one yes oh it has it tw and twice twice well i think we're getting rid of that remote so yeah you should get rid of that remote mm -hmm. All right, so this is going to be just two channel thing on the left and right. Mm hmm. Here. Do you have Stemela? What's that? Do you masticate a Stemela? Oh, you know, it might. Yeah.
You may have noticed the meters on those front amplifiers are bouncing around yeah. one mark to the left of center. That's two watts. Mm -hmm. So that's the system at one tenth of one percent power. Right. You can go all the way up to 20 watts. Okay, there's a plain old two-channel. Tin Pan Alley. <laughs> now I want to play a old plain old DVD in 5.1 surround. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll go to the kind of history of audio. So here is an old movie in 5.1 surround. Okay, <laughs> so there's our old school 7.1 surround, and now we're going to look at the Dolby Atmos, which is a, a non-object based surround. It's using different levels and phase differences between the channels to not just put music out of each individual speaker, but move the sound around the room to wherever you want it. Show this Atmos demonstration disc, and it's a, a cute little short that's going to give you an idea of how it can move the sound all over the room. ask if a system is made for movies or music mm -hmm. and uh, we think that you should make a system very accurately reproduce music and movies will take care of themselves so here's my favorite music cut off of this
and tower little toy twerk. Onyx mm -hmm. uh, and the steel and chassis, and then it goes to uh, Germany and Clear Audio oh, puts geez. on the arm and uh, motor, uh, and we kind of co-developed it with, with Clear Audio using our favorite mm -hmm. uh, parts of theirs. Uh, interesting thing about this, if you look from the side underneath that, it is, it is magnetically levitated. It's just floating there on magnets. Mm. You can see it just floating in air, which is pretty cool. So that isolates it from any mm. vibrations only. I don't, we don't play it in here because even with that, 12, 12 inch subwoofers is not mm -hmm. conducive to a turn Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it would rumble. <laughs> yeah. Pick up. Pick up. But it's cool. Yeah. Right. So, so this this is just for show then. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Let's say uh, about 1970. Most of that. Yeah. So, uh, Actually, I, I had this piece and I had that piece. Vintage. That's our old projector. At the end of the tour, we took pictures, and this is a picture of Mr. Chuck Enchin and myself. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. And this is a Japanese family that I spoke about earlier. These kids are audiophile in the making, 100%. I can see that. Uh, no doubt they'll be buying Macintosh equipment too. My next stop is to visit Audio Classics, which is only a couple miles away from Macintosh, where I met Ryan, who is my salesperson at Audio Classics. Ryan, take me through their Audio Classics Museum. It's all about Macintosh pieces mostly. And he gave me a brief description of each item and their history behind the, um, the items on the shelf in their museum. Please keep watching. A video is coming up next where you will hear Ryan talk about these um, audio classics pieces. I strongly recommend that you visit Audio Classics if you get a chance. Um, that place will definitely blow your mind with the amount of stuff they have. Also Macintosh. So this is just a port, prot, prototype still? Yeah, it's a receiver. It's a receiver. It turned into the Mac 4100. Mm -hmm. But originally, this is what they were. There's only two in existence. Mm -hmm. Ron Evans had both of them. So this is the one that his mother used for her whole life. Whoa. Uh, and then he has the other one still. So, that so only two pieces? There's only two. And that's it. They never made it. Gee, what, what's the story behind they never made it, you know? Uh, they just decided just to go into a different design. Mm -hmm. so if you remember in the 70s, the Pioneers, the Morants had the silver face yeah. and the big yeah. box. Mm -hmm. And that's what the 4100 turned into. Mm -hmm. So aesthetically, they wanted to go for the 4100 mm -hmm. type style. That big look with the silver face plate. Mm -hmm. There's a 2 MR78. Mm -hmm. They never made two ones. Mm -hmm. Tube uh, 77, I think, over here. These are all prototypes that Rich Montefiore had. Mm -hmm. These were in closets over at the engineering facility for years, mm -hmm. MR79 and MR81. They never made those. It was the MR80 was the only one that came out. Mm -hmm. Whoa. And that's the original 2205 prototype. This is a prototype. It's a prototype. If you look at the top of it, mm -hmm. it's completely different than what it turned into. Hmm. Okay. Ouch. 
So what we have down here then, what's, what's over here? These are more industrial special project things. So this is an industrial 75-watt uh, mono amplifier. Mm -hmm. And Mac was used a lot in shaker tables, frequency generators, a lot of uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, processes were done with Macintosh amps. Then these were a lot of display units. Like these two are what they took when the 240 and the 225 were currently being made mm -hmm. they're empty there's no transformers in them oh so they plug them in the filaments light up and that's it mm -hmm. so they were displays for trade shows oh okay so, and, and 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 it's still in that same state now yes yeah. place yeah yeah so this is a museum yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is there's a display 5100 it's got no back to it so it just lights up mm -hmm. there's no just display yep so they put that in a cabinet and put it out and what's this piece here? Oh, this is stereo receiver, is it? No, that's a C20 preamp. preamp. It's a preamp. It's just an exceptionally nice one we put in the Whoa. museum room. You don't see them that nice very often. Whoa. Same thing with the C22. Mm -hmm. You got some clinic stickers on the top that oh, okay. David O'Brien did. Mm -hmm. and this is unique. This is the first, one of the first FM tuners ever that was given to Frank McIntosh by mm -hmm. Edwin Armstrong. Mm -hmm. So even the dial is uh, hand, hand, hand done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's one of the first FM tuners ever. And what is this one? What's that? Uh, it's just somebody had had modified a C8 preamp. Okay. So these are just more vintage pieces that we've come across over the years. So this piece is the first product that Macintosh yeah, ever made. Yeah, this is a C C104. I forget the model number on this one. And it's a what? Yeah, it's, it's a, a it's monaural a, preamp. It's a preamp. Yep. So you think about 1950-ish. Mm -hmm. Mono was the only option. Oh, and this one too? Yeah. No, yeah. it's, it's more of the same type of model. Same, same thing. They do different cabinets on it, and then it evolved into a more elaborate with some EQ settings and stuff for phono, mm -hmm. and then it eventually turned into that C20. Into this guy. Right. Okay. And then there's some some things that came from the Mac clinics when they went all over the oh, place. So these are the test equipment that David used. So the, the clinic was like, uh, uh, if you have a piece of Macintosh, they would, you could bring it over and they could um, align it and all that stuff. Is yeah, they would do a test on it. You mm -hmm. could have it tested, mm -hmm. minor repairs or mm -hmm. could be done on the spot with it. And they would encourage people to bring other brands for them to test oh. and then show you comparisons yes. on test. Mac, yes, Macintosh test stuff versus. Stuff like that to yeah. show you why Macintosh was a, a was the, was what it is. Yeah. product. And why it cost so much. So yeah. it really was a great way to maintain your product for free, mm -hmm. uh, but also to showcase how good Macintosh was at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's just something that we kind of have to... And that's a big test panel that was used mm -hmm. for a while for some of those. I, I, that may have come from another dealer, but that's a complete Macintosh test panel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And this is acoustic analyzer. Yeah. And IB, uh, Macintosh did some projects with like IBM. IBM mm -hmm. started out here. Uh, and up until recently, they were here, still here, but mm -hmm. they, they finally moved the remnants of it's gone. Mm -hmm. But they built some power supplies for IBM. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere in here, this is gone. So there was a project. Um, no, well, this is part of it. Mm -hmm. So this, if you look, that's a monoral preamp sitting vertical. There's a couple mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, two of them. Um, Macintosh got did a program with IBM where uh, they went into churches and a lot of the bell towers were starting to fall into dis disrepair. Mm -hmm. so, you know, churches a couple hundred years old. Um, they would go in with a Mac preamp, a Mac industrial amplifier, yeah, a IBM clock, IBM clock, yeah, which we don't have any of them here, yeah. and then a L cassette. So what is the L cassette? L cassette was kind of between the cassette deck and the reel-to-reel. -reel. Oh. So it was never, like an oversized cassette deck oh, at the time. Oh, never heard of that. Mm. Mm. And they had a timer set up on it through the IBM clock mm -hmm. where 
they would play the chimes of the church mm -hmm. on the timer, mm -hmm. and it was a Macintosh system people were listening to. Oh. <laughs> and they put speakers in there and stuff like that, and that yeah. was the uh, the next step for some of the churches that mm -hmm. did that. So that was a unique project they did. Hmm. I can just see a satellite system. And then their MQ-101 was a three-band EQ for some of the... You know, right? I, mm -hmm. I sold one last year. Did you? So, yes, the one I, I had it for like about almost 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and I they, just, so when Mac was small, mm -hmm. they're smaller than what they are now, mm -hmm. they could do special projects. So if somebody say, I need a five-band EQ, mm -hmm. they'd make a five-band EQ, mm -hmm. and uh, and then, you know, get that for the customer. Come yeah, on yeah, come on in. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So this is, a, this is a museum. He's, yeah, he's yeah, talking yeah, me yeah, through, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking me through the museum. Yeah, yeah. I have that one, yeah, in do Japan. You? Yeah. Two, two, zero, four. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great amplifier. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Yeah. That's a pro. That's what it was. That's what they used to design the 2205. Mm. Mm. So that's a prototype, then cool. one of a kind. Mm. Uh, so it looks a little different than what yours does. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. He says this one was never made. They just, it is a prototype. Oh, prototype. Yeah. Yeah, there's only two of those made. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ron Evans, the engineer, Wait, had them both. That mm -hmm. is the rear. Yeah, that's one of them. There's yeah. lots of rare things. Yeah, they're all rare. Him. <laughs> <laughs> He's rare. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, tell me, about, you never talk about this piece. Oh, MR55, that's their first tuner. Mm. Um, difficult. Mm. Um, difficult? Yeah, they're very hard to fix now. Mm. Uh, we And no costly. Because mm. uh, everything has to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of time. That was, mm -hmm. It's... Uh, it's, and then in the end, it was such early You're going to leave? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Hold. He's in charge of chaos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, everything else, we're all on the phone all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, talking to people all over the world, and then you get people like... Like us, walking in. Live from Hawaii <laughs> and Japan in the same day. It's, yeah. I, I go home and tell my yeah. friends. Back that, yeah, and you don't want to be caught at the yeah. end yeah. of the day. Yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to yeah. be do that. Yeah. I don't want to be. I got something for it. I'll be right okay. back. I got something for it. Yeah. This is a Macintosh clock. It's an interesting clock. Hmm.
have that. Oh, here. So all Macintosh right. Macintosh on the other side. Ah, oh, thanks, Ren. This You're is awesome. Welcome. This is awesome, man. This is awesome. Now I can sip some coffee and something while or, listening. Yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, so one one other piece I want to ask sure. you about. Um, I noticed these. We didn't talk about these over in the museum here. Oh yeah, there's so many things that. Yeah. yeah. So this is a well, that's all tube. Um, mm -hmm. That's a receiver, a preamp, isn't it? No, it's a tuner. Just straight it's just AM a tuner. Yeah. Wow. MR65, 66. MR66. That's yep. beautiful. AMFM tuner. Yep. It's beautiful. That's good. And then C11 was another preamp. Mm -hmm. There's a 65B. So these all came out when stereo was starting to come in, because mm -hmm. up until then it was mono FM, mm -hmm. and then there was these little multiplex adapters so you could receive stereo. Oh, okay. And for a while they were outboard, so separate box, and then eventually they started working them into, into the unit. Into units. the unit, yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and same thing here too. Yep, that's the standalone box for it. That's what it, exactly what it is. Oh. Hard to find those now. Perfect, perfect um, museum piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what is this piece here? Uh, this is another one of the preamps you saw in the other room, just okay. in a nice cabinet and stuff like that. So you'll see some mixed in things of regular stock, mm -hmm. like the new C22 is yeah. mixed in with some of these vintage pieces. Yes, yes. It just fit and right you can kind of go past it because, and then you have the original right next to it to compare. Mm -hmm. That's the original. This is the original and this is the... That's the current the one. Reproduction. Yeah. Yeah. And then some other unique pieces, some more industrial units. Uh, this was a Macintosh stereo subwoofer that came out of a Ford mm. GT. Mm -hmm. And then the meter module that came with them. So for a while they were doing... Um, uh, car audio? Car audio. Yes. I think this one actually came... For a while they were in Subarus mm. of all cars. Mm. But I remember when the GT was, they, they brought it to the factory, mm -hmm. and Ford sent a guy with them, mm -hmm. so nobody would take it for a spin. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you, you got to know how to drive those things. But So the engineers put it in the building, and they just worked yeah. doing measurements and all sorts of stuff to measure the, the mm -hmm. perfect area for mm -hmm. it. Um, that was when Clarion owned them. Okay. You mean when Clarion owned Macintosh? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, they are in a group, right? They're in the. They're in a group that's based in Texas, mm. and they just did. Well, you saw they mm. just did a big, huge expansion over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So things are doing well there, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And what what's your story with um, Audio Lab, uh, Audio um, Research? They were I part of the group. They were. I yeah. don't know what. Yeah. I don't know the details on yeah. that actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll just Google it. Yeah. Yeah. And then the rest are just. Nice pieces that yeah. we've seen. We like to keep the shelves full. Yes. And even vintage Moran's pieces on the other side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Cause I like this piece here, this Moran's. Yeah, piece that was that's one of ours. We had that made. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It looks like it, we always like the looks of the Model 9. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the aesthetics is a, a Model 9, but mm -hmm. everything behind the front panel is completely different. Oh, really? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> It's a pentode and triode amplifier. Mm, yeah. So that's what's connected to the uh, clutch out there. Yeah. One of those. Um, yeah, and some uh, beautiful vintage Marantz pieces. Yeah. Sansui was another big yeah, name yeah, for back, it, back in the day. a long time. They yeah. sounded very good. Tried mm. to copy Macintosh. Mm -hmm. Um, this is Fisher, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. One of the tuners. Yeah. Fisher. So, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, they, these were the great systems. Yeah. Mac, yeah. Marantz, Fisher, mm -hmm. Scott, mm -hmm. Sansui. Sansui, yeah. yeah. Vintage audio research preamp. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. And these actually just got some of these are Georgians. Mm. Um, these are unique because when they look different. They look like clips, isn't it? Yeah, they're very similar. Oh, These yeah, are from the 60s. Yeah, yeah, and uh, initially that was mono, so mm -hmm. we only got one. And then you could buy the companion speaker. Mm -hmm. But they didn't make them the same it's way. It's the same, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's kind of different. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. kind of different, but they're but, similar. But, yeah, if you walk in, you, you won't tell. You have to know. Right. Yeah, you have to okay. know. Or just look at them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Up next are pictures of my current system. After visiting Audit Classic and Macintosh, you can't help but having that upgrade bug. But you know, that's a tall order, um, but we'll see. Um, just give it some more time. Uh, yes, um, I hope you enjoy this, um, this video and if you get a chance, visit Macintosh and Audio Classics. I mean, for Macintosh fan, you will be blown away what you see. It's, it was a real, real good um, trip. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you.